Wonderful. Thanks, everyone, for joining. My name is Anna Abramova, and I am with SQL DBM. Uh, excited and grateful for the fact that I can participate in educational sessions uh, like this one and uh, partially share the story of SQL DBM and then share some industry and product updates and also connect with our audience. So today I have um, quite a special reason. We're going to talk about SQL DBM for um, Google BigQuery. And uh, with me today, I have Ritinder from SQL DBM, Solution Architect, hi Ritinder. And uh, our special guest is Bruce Sandel from uh, Google Cloud. Hi, Good morning, Bruce. Anna. I'll go ahead and get started. Really, I know a lot of people are still joining, but for the sake of time and because we have a lot of content content to go through, we'll we'll just get rolling. So we'll we'll speak about uh, SQL DBM and BigQuery. Um, quick agenda. Uh, we'll go through introductions. Then we'll go into behind the scenes story where Bruce will Bruce. I'll I'll ask you a little bit of uh, how things um, came together. And then once uh, Bruce tells us the, the background story, we can go into the demo um, part of this session where Retinder will walk us through a live example of using SQL DBM for a BigQuery project. And then we'll make sure that at the end we'll leave, I'm planning to leave a little bit of time for q and I know this is a favorite section usually based on our previous ex uh, experience with webinars. So we'll leave plenty of time. The session is recorded. So yes, if you do have to step out for a second, no worries, we'll, we'll share the recording. So um, Bruce, over, um, over to you for an introduction first. Um, welcome, great to have you as a special guest. Uh, what is, um, yeah, maybe tell us more about your background and uh, what do you do uh, in Google today? Sure, uh, thanks for inviting me to participate. My name is Bruce Sandell and I'm a partner solutions architect at Google Cloud. And the team that I work on is focused primarily on data and analytics partners. And prior to coming to Google, I worked at several large companies, specifically Apple, HP, Cisco. And I've also worked at seven startups. The majority of my career has been database focused in some capacity. Uh, either as a developer, DBA, consultant, or architect. And I also spent several years managing customer support teams. I came to Google as part of the Looker acquisition. When I was at Looker, I worked with all of Looker's technology partners, including ETL tools, data governance products, and databases. And about half my time was spent on managing our relationship with Google and the BigQuery team in particular. My role at Google is similar. I work on a team that supports Google technology partners, uh, primarily that are focused on data and, and, and analytics, uh, particularly with those partners that wanna have integrations with BigQuery or wanna build data focused products that run on Google Cloud Platform. That's, 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 that, yeah, that, I love, that's a big introduction and I know you're doing a lot of things. So um, that's just that's just awesome to see people who are making things happen. And then I understand it's it's a lot of the internal story and also supporting supporting companies um, in uh, in their integration with uh, BigQuery and, and go to market opportunities. Um, and so in in regards to SQL DBM and we're in this in the specific space of data modeling. So I know I know you you have a reason of why data modeling is a special subject for you. And so can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, as I mentioned many years ago, I worked with some large companies and uh, I had the opportunity to work on some of the earliest large scale enterprise data warehouses. Uh, we spent a lot of time modeling data and I got to see firsthand the impact that a well-conceived data model had on the success of the project. Uh, in particular, when I was at Apple in the very early 90s, the Apple Data Warehouse was considered to be pretty groundbreaking. Now, the concept of centralizing data from all types of transactional systems was relatively new. And when it came to figuring out you know, what data was important and how data from disparate systems were related, 
the business users were usually the ones with the best understanding of, of how that data related across systems, you know, particularly when it came to like uh, linking customer data between systems. So when we met with uh, business users, our goal was to come up with a conceptual data model. And this is a model that described their business systems in business terms. So entities, attributes, and relationships, you know, didn't have to understand anything about databases and tables, just, you know, what concepts were important to them and what, what data described those concepts. And uh, as a matter of fact, everybody that worked on the Apple Data Warehouse in any technical capacity was required to take a three full day class on conceptual data modeling and how it applied to the Apple Data Warehouse. So following some of the guidelines from the conceptual data modeling course and in our interactions with business users turned out to be really successful. And when we spoke in terms of entities, attributes and relationships, it became second nature for our users and it resulted in sort of a common business language that enabled those users to know that they were being heard and, and that the requirements were being understood because rather than having to you know, sort through a, a hundred page document describing our interactions, they could just see everything that we had talked about in the form of a, a visual data model that we created often as we were talking about it. Um, so once we got the data from the, the business users, you know, it was time to start doing a little bit of, of validation. You know, when they told us that two systems, the data was joined in a certain way, um, you know, we'd go back and, and we would check that out. And inevitably you would find that, uh, you know, a high percentage of it worked that way, but, uh, you know, there'd be a bunch of data that didn't join up as described and you would try and figure out why that was. And, and what you'd always find is that there was somebody at the company that had been there for 25 years that knew that there was data from two systems ago that had to be joined in a different way from all the other data. Uh, and that data wasn't, and that information wasn't really captured anywhere. So, um, you know, putting it in the data model, even in the form of comments or adding some comments to, uh, you know, just the way that uh, attributes were, or that entities were linked in the model was, was, you know, kind of the perfect way to capture this legacy knowledge that probably would have gone away as soon as that person retired. So, that's uh, you know enough, I guess, about conceptual models. So the, the technical team would take that you know that logical or conceptual model and, and turn it into a physical model that takes into account all of the advanced features that the database provides and optimize it based on you know performance and usage patterns. And then that physical model becomes the versioned and version controlled source of truth for the database. And for a new developer or a new user of the data warehouse, the models gave them a fantastic comprehensive overview of, of the data and the relationships. So I could go on all day about this topic, but I'm gonna stop now other than to say that we used a similar methodology building data warehouses at Cisco and HP with similar success. Yeah, and it's definitely it's definitely something we we in SQL DBM uh, is an example of a story we in SQL DBM deal with every day uh, of customers that, like you said, just trying to find a balance between the technical and the business story, and then uniting that and using data modeling as a unification point for that, starting from conceptual to logical, and then going to actual physical implementation. So I I love yeah. that. It, it worked really well for us. You, you've seen it all. You've seen it all. And so, Bruce, why did you reach out to SQL DBM originally? What was the driver for that? And how did you learn about SQL DBM in the first place? Well, some of our sales teams had gotten some questions from some really big customers about what data modeling tools we recommend for BigQuery. And nobody knew the answer. So those questions ended up coming to our team. Uh, I did some research and I was surprised to find that there's no data modeling tools or there was none at that time that supported BigQuery. So I started looking into the data modeling tool landscape because I haven't been involved with it for a long time. Now I had some pretty specific requirements for the tool because you know I knew the features that had benefited me when I was spending a lot of my time doing data modeling. Um, so I was looking for, you know, a product that supported all of those features and, you know, that supported the cloud data warehouse as well. 
And, you know, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I was, you know, was kind of adamant on having these features is that when you hand your data model to somebody for the first time and, and let them spend some time with it, you know, you get feedback from them that usually comes in one of two forms. Either they just hand it back to you and say, ah, I don't get it. Uh, or they say, you know, this makes a lot of sense and I have some follow-up questions for you. So, you know, getting the response that they get it is, is really rewarding and, it, you know, it's indicative of a job well done. So having the right set of features to make your model organized and readable and taking advantage of those features is really important. So as an example, like, the, you know, does the tool allow you to specify naming conventions? If I know I want to add a created date and a last updated date to every table, can I create a template so that happens automatically every time I create a table? Can I color code things that go together? Can I group objects into subject areas? Can I flag data with specific attributes like PII? Can I add notes to the model even if they aren't associated with a specific object? You know, those are those are all features that really make a big difference um, in, in how readable and usable your model is. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted a tool that had support for other cloud data warehouses that I was familiar with so I could see the level of support they provided. Because, you know, it's important that the tools support all the features that make the data warehouse unique and not just sort of a generic set of features that line up to, to any data warehouse. So if the data, you know, if the database supports things like partitioning and partition expiration, clustering, materialized views, did the tool support all of those things? Because if you can't generate your database schema uh, from your physical model, it takes away a lot of the value of having that physical model as your source of truth. And kind of the last criteria was if I could find a SaaS-based tool that wouldn't break the bank so that it would be accessible for our smaller customers as well, you know, that would be a big plus. So as I went through my research, there was only a few tools that fit all the criteria. And so I started reading a lot of product reviews and uh, I haven't shared this information with you before, but uh, the thing that really stood out to me is that in the SQL DBM reviews, you know, everybody says it's a great product, but many of the reviews also mention how great the team was to work with. So, um, mm, you know, that was- that, I hear that, that a lot, actually. That, you know, that, was, that was big Thank for you. me. And so I, you know, I called and got connected with the team and here we are. Beautiful. I, I love how far we've come. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much for, for sharing um, the story and uh, kind of the, yeah, the real the, the feeling of uh, from from research to finding out to actually uh, communicating with our team. So it's uh, it's because of the feedback from the audience that we're able to know and calibrate our direction because yes, we have ideas of where we want the product to go and um, but it's important to get those ideas checked and filtered through the reality and through speaking speaking to actual real people um, that have experience and have a vision and um, uh, can give us can give us the feedback. So thank you for being that person. We appreciate you. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, for our next section now that we want to actually see, okay, what came out of it? What can you do in SQL DBM now when you're working with Google BigQuery? Uh, Retinder will switch over to you in just a second. Uh, Bruce, I know we have just a couple slides to share. So you can maybe get us um, up to date on the context around Google BigQuery. Why? Because we have different type of uh, customers right now. A lot of people are just starting their journey with Google BigQuery. Some are experienced uh, users and um, longstanding customers. So I guess this will bring everyone on the same page. And I have the slides open uh, right now. So we can, um, you can maybe give us uh, a little background. Yeah, sure. I'll give just a quick overview. So uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with Google tools like Search, Maps, and Translate. Uh, and if you think about what they do, which is providing billions of people with fast, highly personalized data at a pretty limitless scale with a user interface that requires no training, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so you go ahead and switch slides. So if you want the same limitless scale for your own business analytics, then BigQuery is the foundation for that. 
BigQuery allows you to bring all of Google's innovation and resources to the service of your queries. BigQuery takes advantage of the same global storage, cluster management, networking, and query execution engine that's used by Google Search. The next slide, please. And Google help, you know, BigQuery helps you do more. It's serverless, so there's no infrastructure to maintain. It works with all types of data, even if that data is in other databases or even if it's in other clouds. It handles all types of workloads uh, and includes tools like BQML and integrations with Vertex AI for executing your AI, AI ML workloads in SQL without ever having to leave BigQuery. For your real-time requirements, BigQuery's BI engine provides in-memory analysis for sub-second response times. And now that you've got all your data into BigQuery, the next step is to use it for analytics. And Google provides a number of ways for you to work with your data. If you prefer spreadsheets, connected sheets allows you to easily work with your BigQuery data in Google Sheets. Uh, Looker Studio is our free business intelligence tool that's embedded in BigQuery and has millions of active users. And Looker is our enterprise business intelligence platform. And last but certainly not least is our incredible partner ecosystem featuring partners like SQL BBM. Uh, we have over 700 technology partners that work with BigQuery to help you make the most of your data. Yeah, at this point, the community. So I had a chance to attend Google Cloud Next in San Francisco just last month in August. And just the feeling of the community around uh, Google Cloud, the number of partners is uh, breathtaking. And this was, this was great to be part of it. Well, we're happy to have you as a part. Thank you, thank you. All right, now that we have a lot of enough context for, for what we are about to cover, I will switch over to Pretender Labana from SQL DBM, our solution architect. Pretender, can you, um, you can start sharing screen. I know you have a demo prepared and maybe give us a quick background as well on, on uh, what do you do at SQL DBM? Yeah, uh, so I'm a solutions architect at SQL DBM. And I've been working uh, with database management for all my career. A big, big fan of SQL DBM's uh, product. Uh, small story, I actually was looking for this product for my previous company because it was really hard to maintain and keep everyone up to date when you're working with um, desktop applications and you have to like let them know whether it's through Slack or email, letting them know it's like, okay, by the way, I've made these changes. So this is the updated product and so on. All right. And when I found out that we have a cloud application that would just help us collaborate and I was just breathtaking. It was like, it would save me so much, so many hours of work. And I got an offer eventually from SQL DVM and here I am promoting the product and Every single day is an excitement journey. The team is amazing, as Bruce said earlier. We have a wonderful team and it's just a big happy family. Um, I'm also one of the subject matter experts for Google BigQuery. And I'm located in Canada, Ottawa. So uh, if you guys are ever in town, let me know. I would love to meet up with everyone. So on that note, I'm just going to share my screen just a second. All right, um, just let me know if you're able to see my screen or if you would like me to zoom in a little further for better visibility. Looks good, looks good on my end. Uh, I'll let you know if there's right, comments perfect. we received more. Awesome. So the first thing that we're starting off with since we're talking about BigQuery is uh, when you log into BigQuery, uh, you can run a statement and it will give you the DDL. Now getting a DDL for massive, lot of tables and everything, you'll get this type of script. Now, this is a very simple one. Again, you can have a lot more columns. And the way we visualize this within the tool itself is like this. So you get a table, everything's put together. If you have any data types, all of those will be shown here, right? Especially with struct, um, if you're using that data type, it will tell you uh, which nested columns you have within that and everything. So we have a rows here. If we look at this table, again, you'll be able to find table properties on the right-hand side for all of them. And then if you want to 
specify any expiries, uh, uh, partition filters and everything, you'll be able to do that. And we have some indexes and keys created over here that you'll be able to leverage. So what I'm gonna do is take you to the tool itself. And we'll start with creating a brand new project. And we'll go over some of the collaborations and stuff that you will be able to leverage within the tool to complement uh, BigQuery. So if we go to accounts over here, a couple of things, you will be able to set up your Git integrations um, under integrations. And then we also have our app token provided over here. So if you ever need to leverage the API to extract information and reformat a certain way to show it to your users, you would be able to do that over here. Then we also have user groups where you will be able to create a group number of users together. So it's better accessibility when you're sharing projects. Uh, by default, when you're collaborating within SQL DBM and you create a project, it's set up on one person can edit a project at a time. Now, if you have a high traffic and you want to be able to collaborate with everyone, so if I want to be able to collaborate with Anna, Bruce, and everyone, what I can do is enable concurrent working on my project, which will change the structure of the project as the following. I'll have a main branch, and from there, I'll have individual branches where I'll be able to work and have that push. Uh, so now what we'll do is start with a brand new project, and we'll see how you can bring in what you have within your BigQuery into SQL DBM. Just a matter of a couple of steps. So the first thing you'll see is a pop-up. It'll ask you which database you're working in. We'll select BigQuery, and you'll have two options. You can either start from new if you don't have anything already created within BigQuery, which would uh, the tool will allow you to start from ground up. Uh, since I already have a data set created, I'm going to bring that in by going navigating to our reverse engineering screen. Over here, we'll see a couple of options. I'm going to use the blue button to connect directly into SQL DBM. I'm just going to stop sharing just to not be able to share my credentials. And then another option for you is you'll be able to either just drop in your file or simply copy paste your DDL script. All right, let me just share again now that we're in. Yeah, I like that it provides the option to the user to just pick and choose. Obviously, direct Definitely. Mm -hmm. And we always recommend to use service accounts so you can control the access and everything. So I'm going to select the data set, click apply. It will generate you the DDL that we'll see over here. Once we click upload, you'll get a quick preview on the left-hand side letting you know which tables we're bringing in. This is also the location where your users will have the opportunity to be able to manually pick and choose which objects they want to accept and bring into the project if they don't want to accept everything. Once we click import, visualizations for those objects will now be created and we can use the auto layer functionality to organize everything. Once that is done, uh, as you already know, BigQuery will support uh, primary keys and foreign keys, but it will not uh, enforce you to use them. So let's say if you don't have a certain tables that might not have primary keys and foreign keys defined, you can use a suggested relationship. Uh, the way it's built is you would use the patterns over here to specify which keywords to look for. You'd specify which keywords to ignore based on that a list of suggestions will be provided for you. And over here, you'll be able to manually pick and choose which ones you want to accept. And if you ever need to modify the suggestion that the tool gives you, you have the capabilities to be able to do that over here. So let's just unselect, we'll click apply. And again, all of these are at a virtual level, so it's not making any physical impact to your model. Uh, if you do want to have that applied, you will be able to convert all the VP, uh, VPKs to a primary key. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, we so, have brought the project. Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to comment. It's a comment and a question. So basically, what you're showing right now is SQL DBM's ability to connect to BigQuery, read the syntax, and then we will understand if, um, because um, BigQuery supports primary keys, foreign keys, we'll able to understand if those are already defined in the DDL, we'll just showcase what's there. And if they are not, we will, the user has an option to just use SQL DBM's mechanism to, I guess, in a very fast way, see what, what tables sh maybe should be connected. That's correct. Rather than having to scan through, you could have thousands of tables within your uh, project. Rather than having to scan through them manually, the tool will help you identify them. And from there, you'll have the opportunity to even filter further if needed. 
And now, uh, as Bruce mentioned earlier, we do help you specify standards. So what we did just now is reverse engineer, we visualized everything. And now before we start sharing, we want to build a standard. So once we start collaborating, everything is kept consistent. In order for, to do that, under naming conventions, you'll have three options. Specifying a case standard, and you'll be able to see what this case standard looks like on the right-hand side. Name mapping is where you can specify specific patterns in terms of how you want your tables to be named. If you want all your tables to start with an apple, let's say, you can specify those properties here. And then glossary is where you can rename objects. So let's say you have account and you want account to now be represented as ACC. So you would be able to do that here. You also have the option if there are multiple Google Big Current projects and they all share the same glossary. So what I mean by that is all of those projects, you're changing account to represent as ACC. You can also have that populated in Excel and have that upload across multiple projects rather than having to recreate the same uh, glossary. Once we have specified all of these projects, we recommend you to click on validate on project saved and then save the settings as what that will do is anytime you're making a change or a collaborator within the project is making a change, when you click the save button, a validation check will get triggered to make sure is everything within your project up to the standards that we have specified. If not, a pop-up will appear letting you know which objects don't meet that criteria and the tool will help you update that automatically rather than you having to go through the entire project and update, um, trying to identify and update them manually. So on that note, I'm going to switch to a project uh, that's already set up. So I'm going to do this. So as you can see over here, if I zoom out, uh, some of the tables, we have color coordination available. You'll be able to sort things out. If you want certain objects to be represented with certain colors, you can do that. We also have the object filterization over here. In the share icon over here, this is where you can add different users. And it'll also show you what type of users they are. Are they a consumer? Are they a modeler? Consumer is anyone who has uh, read access to the project. So they won't be able to modify any of your models over here. But what they can do is leave a comment for you. And anytime you're tagging a specific user, they'll get an email notification letting them know that they have been tagged. Uh, modelers, anyone who has editorial access, so what that means is they're able to reverse engineer, forward engineer, make edits to your model and everything. And then we also have third type of license, which is governance. Now, governance users will be able to leverage, if we go to the database documentation page, uh, the governance fields. They can create uh, as many cust customizable um, fields as they like. So I have a data steward created. So if I wanted to track who owns what type of tables and who's responsible for that, I can record that over here as a dropdown and just populate them. Uh, you also have the option of storing text just simple text, it has a multi-select options and a true and false. Once we have set all of this up, now you want to be able to locate all of this information. And the way you would be able to do that is through the reports, which is also another category under governance fields. So over here, once the page loads up, we'll, we'll be able to see what type of data stewards we're collecting for individual tables. So if I want to look for a specific keyword, I will be able to do that here and you'll be able to filter through objects. So we know, okay, ID is a column name. Um, I filtered it so it only shows me the column names and as I select, it'll take us to that object as we can see here. So uh, uh, Tinder, you, this, this mm -hmm. page, the reports and um, governance piece, this is not editable from, this is the kind of reporting page just to view, and then the editing happens in the tool itself. That's correct. So the data, uh, the data documentation page that we're currently in this one, this is where you do all the edits, the recording and everything, and you would use the reports to just visualize. So if you have users who just want to be able to access the information, but you don't want them to be able to edit anything, they'll be able to use the reports. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So coming back to that original point we were making of uh, technical and business stakeholders and getting on the same page. This is more of a business friendly uh, summary page uh, for, for the, maybe for the BI team as a, as a way mm -hmm. for the architects to, to represent their, uh, their work. Definitely. And then another thing we have under data um, governance is our pages, which will be coming out uh, very soon. Uh, 
later this week, which would allow you, these are just wiki pages, which will allow you to even collect additional information that you want regarding the project. And the best part is everything's within one application. So you don't have to have multiple applications open and you'll be able to record this. That being said, we are not competing with Dataplex, uh, which is a data governance tool for uh, Google BigQuery. Uh, it actually complements it. So if you want to be able to record something like um, that is model driven, you'll be able to do that within the tool. And then you also have Dataplex to complement BigQuery. So I'm going mm -hmm. to just take us back to the project itself. And the next thing we'll go over a couple of things that we talked about earlier is uh, uh, the subject area. So you can have fairly large projects and you might not want to have every, it can get very hard to visualize everything. So in order for me to visualize my diagram, I have to zoom out really far to the point that I can't really read any of my objects. So what you can do is have them broken down into smaller uh, subject areas and diagrams. So I have a BI team folder where I have the logical names and the business. Logical are giving me all the business terms. So if I select on this table, we also have our Google BigQuery friendly names provided over here, which again will be part of your DDL when you forward engineer, where you can visualize all of them. If you want to uh, view a conceptual, you'll be able to do that. And then we have different view modes, depending on what type of audience you're interacting with. They will be able, they will have the opportunity to change their view mode so they can get the correct information rather than having to create multiple documents for them. Uh, the next thing we'll go over is our compare revision. So as you make changes within the project, you'll be able to compare any two revisions together over here, as we can see, and you'll be able to see the differences between the two provided over here. And then if we go to forward engineering, and if you um, have your integration set up, for example, I have my GitHub set up, as you generate your script, you'll be able to push that to your repository. And then from there, you would have either schema change or flyway to then help you deploy to BigQuery itself. You can also get a preview in terms of how that would look like over here, like how many files will be going into, uh, into GitHub. And you also have the option of generating an alter script based on any two uh, versions. Now, everyone works with different environments. So if that is the use case that you guys have, then you can define your environments over here. And if we go to release screen over here, you'll be able to compare any two environments together and see how do they differ. And same thing over here, you'll be able to generate an alter script to then help you uh, push that to your Git repository. And from there, you'll be able to have it merged to the specific branch to maintain all your environments. Yeah, the code management piece, it's kind of not a, not by default expected functionality out of an ERD tool. And I guess that's a reminder that SQL DBM serves as a much more than just a visual ERD tool, right? There is, you have the piece of the data models, you have the piece of uh, documentation, and then now really model-driven documentation and governance, right? So kind of um, adding additional layers of metadata to your data model. And then the, the, sec the third piece is the, you know, the environments, the comparisons, and just working with SQL in a, in a convenient way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And the best part is like, we're all humans. We can make mistakes, right? And we don't want anyone to have to redo anything. So Everything is version controlled. If you ever need to roll back to a previous ver revision within the tool itself, it will allow you to do that and maintain the history so you know exactly at what given point you went back. And then we also have some templates and flags over here that would help you keep track of things So and to maintain consistency. So some of the tables that you might be seeing over here, uh, you see created by and cre um, created on are repeated throughout. So have multiple templates specified over here uh, one is on demand, one is created on inheritance. What the inheritance one really means is anytime I create a new table, it will automatically inherit those columns. And then you can have certain templates that might be unique to specific tables and you might not want to be calling them throughout the entire, throughout all tables. So you can define all of them here to make sure that uh, the property names, their data types, their descriptions, everything stays consistent throughout your model. 
And then we also have our flags over here, which are again, SQL DBM native that you can, by default, they'll come in their color names, but again, you'll be able to rename them and use them as in progress or PII or need, um, need review. So if I were to just go to this table and I wanted to mark this, that this table needs some review, I can do that. If someone comes in and they want to see all the, all the flags or objects that have need review, they can do that and simply everything else will simply hide from the screen. So you have a couple of options over here in terms of how much information you want to see at a time within a screen and so on. Okay. And a couple of other things I want to highlight um, when you're using the tool is some of the resources that will really help you. So if we go to the help menu over here, a couple of things you'll be able to find is some, some of the documentation, which has step-by-step -step instructions and video, small, short videos to show you how you can achieve those things. And then our support line that would help you uh, get in touch with our team. Another thing I want to mention is if you go to our website over here, a couple of things that you'll be able to find is on our home screen, we have our blue button for try modeling. Again, this is a very limited um, trial. Uh, if you want a full access um, trial to the tool, you can definitely book a demo with us and we'll be more than happy to show you how the tool works. And then we also have our change log over here, which would give you a walk down in terms of what new functionalities are coming out and what we release every month. And yeah, yeah, our release off. schedule. Yeah, our release schedule is pretty, is pretty rapid and and very very rich in terms of objects mm -hmm. and items we're putting out into the world. It's a good reminder for sure. Yeah, definitely for sure. Uh, Regina, while you were speak, I know we uh, this kind of concludes this session. I do see a couple questions that are already got asked on the functionality, specific functionality. So maybe I'd suggest let's circle back to it in just a minute, because I know uh, Bruce Retinder, we spoke about um, really Google BigQuery specific objects and support in SQL DBM. So I do have just one quick, I did put a quick summary of what those are. I guess Retinder just kind of extend onto the points you were, you, you showed us how to, uh, how to connect how to how the direct connection works you mm -hmm. showed us a way to manually import ddl if relevant yeah. you spoke about data sets obviously tables relationship between, between tables primary key foreign keys uh, partition clustering keys what um, indexes views and then i know that functions and procedures these are still the only items that that are remaining in, in for SQL DBM to add. Bruce, from your standpoint, you mentioned how these are these are the important, it's a very important for the tool to support unique objects um, in the data warehouse. And, you know, it's great that um, Retender showed um, how the uh, primary and foreign keys are used. And because even though they're they're not enforced, so if you're going to use primary and foreign keys, uh, you kind of have to uh, enforce those with your application. Uh, but those are still used by the BigQuery optimizer. So you know, just having to find those, uh, even though they're not enforced, can Im improve the performance of your queries. So yeah, it'll be uh, we'll we'll stay in close contact to make sure that uh, that you're always up to date on the latest advances. Uh, in, in BigQuery changes that'll affect, you know, how Absolutely. people need to model. Absolutely. That's, and that's the promise we make, actually. That's that's a very important point to the fact that because of the fact that SQL DBM keeps, keeps growing and evolving, we're also part of our promise when we when we pick a, a platform that we support, we also make a promise that it's not only that we will support it at that time that we release the connection, we'll also keep supporting all the new uh, reveals and objects and uh, functionality. So that basically the, the SQL DBM tool is always up to date with um, BigQuery world. So agree. Ritinder, anything from you to, to add on about this summary on these points? Uh, no, I, I think uh, we don't really have time to like dive into every single property just yet, just because of the time constraints that we have. 
But if anyone has any questions, again, our team would be more than happy to like give them a walkthrough where you can find them within the tool because there are really a lot of functionalities that we could go on and on about that we support for BigQuery itself. And again, majority yeah. of the documentation you'll be able to find on our help center to even show the users how they can navigate and be able to locate those properties. Yeah, it, it, it will require a full, full separate webinar for that. So, which we can, we, we can definitely looking forward to organizing that can definitely make it happen. Um, I do have some, again, questions on recording. Yes, there will be a, rec we are recording this session. We will post this to SQL DBM LinkedIn page and to YouTube. So please reach out to myself or um, anyone from SQL DBM team will be happy to share. It'll probably take maybe a couple of days for us to upload it to YouTube um, in the final shape and form. There was also a question on continuous learning. And uh, Bruce Retinder, if you have any good resources to recommend just from top of your head, uh, feel free to, to drop them um, and share with the audience. If not, just specific to SQL DBM world, I did want to share um, this resource. We have, we call it Data Modeling Academy. So it's pretty much an educational journey that we want to take you on. So far, we have three courses, and the most popular one is SQL DBM Fundamentals. Uh, this is a self-paced training at, at the end of which you can get, even get certified. There is a quite a challenging quiz at the end of it, but if you, if you study well and uh, watch all the videos, you'll be able to pass and um, get certified uh, in SQL DBM Fundamentals. It's a number of videos around all of the functionality, screen by screen, feature by feature with real examples. It's 24 lessons, one and a half hours of video content. And uh, yeah, a lot, of, um, a lot of people have actually gone through that training by now. And we've, we've been getting uh, really good feedback from the community. Now, this one is SQL DBM specific. We do also put out a lot of resources that are just generic industry. Uh, to share and uh, Ritina, I believe you're one of the instructors for for this course so yeah I love the, the educational journey for us other questions uh, sorry anything to add on the resources for learning and um, practicing data modeling no we okay. have great great article on medium as well so People can always uh, leverage those, but I would say Academy is probably the best bet to get mm -hmm. familiarized with the tool and get the fundamentals out of the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Next question I have, um, there was a question in Q&A subject. Can you show more on the Confluence integration with SQL DBM? Oh yeah, I don't think we've showed that. We didn't. So the way the Confluence integration with SQL DBM would work, uh, and would you like me to just share the screen again? Yeah, if you can, that would yeah. be awesome. So let me just do that over here. So as you can see over here, so you'll be able to embed any of the SQL DBM projects within Confluence and all, let's see, Confluence that ha itself has 100 users, all of those 100 users will be able to get a view access to that project. They'll be able to zoom in, zoom out, um, navigate through different subject areas, different diagrams, and they will get the updated changes. Now you can also lo lock it so they only see specific changes. It all depends on the user's needs and how you want to collaborate. And the and it won't consume up any of your consumer licenses either. And then we also have the JIRA integration that again, you'll be able to leverage through the comments to build that transparency in terms of why you have added the object, which ticket does it belong to, why was it modified and everything. So you can get the full picture in terms of why changes came in and what tickets they were uh, connected to. And you'll also be able to update the comments for the JIRA tickets uh, directly from the tool itself. Yeah, the Atlassian cloud products. Uh, Jira is a big one for tracking, right? For again, for collaboration and tracking. And then Confluence, I guess, 
it's it's again for the the use case of business sharing with when it, especially when it comes to large number of consumer users or view folks downstream teams that need to have access to to the model at any given time and i love that the confluence integration is uh, alive in bed so it's not it's not just a screenshot that you just posted and forgot about it. it it keeps refreshing so if i push a new version and there's a new master model the confluence will reflect it i think it's a very very big point um and it's solving a very big pain pain for clients so i'm glad i'm glad we had i'm glad we had that question um uh, as um in, okay this is kind of a long form we can talk about this forever what is the recommended data modeling approach sql dbm would advise on bigquery and i'll try to attempt it Tinder, Bruce, if you have anything to add, please jump in. I would say that there is no one, one size fits all in a recommended data modeling approach. It's really not, it shouldn't be tool dependent. Um, SQL DBM supports it all. So it could be dimensional modeling. It could be data vault. A lot of, a lot of companies are choosing, uh, choosing data vault for, for their practice. And it, it really depends. There's no one approach that we would advocate for, for us, we just support them all and then give you the tool for, for whatever, whatever you decide to go with. I'm sure well, we can, again, this, this could, we could write a full article on, on the topic and uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and I see Keith from our team is also helping out there in the chat. Um, SQL DBM will support dimensional modeling and um, data vault will be more yeah, to your organization's strategy, use case and experience. So yeah, someone else saying it's never a one size fits all. So that's kind of what we see internally as well. When we, when we speak to clients, we, we find a lot of different use cases and implementation patterns. Let me see what else we received. Um, migration of models. Um, Putina, do you want to cover that of when uh, when a client, or I'll take this one also, feel free to add on. I would say if a user is was using a, another data modeling tool and wants to migrate to SQL DBM, actually the process would be pretty simple just because data modeling tools operate with forward and reverse engineering. You would forward engineer the model out of the previous tool and then reverse engineer into SQL DBM. With that, Yes, you will. If there's any custom metadata you are storing in that other tool, you will lose it. However, the, the DDL code and the actual model is probably 90% of what you need. So we see, we see users moving over with no problem. Okay. I think that was couple more questions, but Retinder covered them in a demo. So I'll just re refer back to the recording. Um, yes, the recording will be shared. All right, I think uh, that concludes, concludes our session. I don't see any more questions. So uh, let's wrap it up. I know we're, I know we have short time today and there's only so much we can cover in a uh, 50 minute time slot. So. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Bruce, for, for your advocacy for our product and continuous support, as well as joining today's session. Yeah, thank that was you. my pleasure. Thank you. you know, thank you guys for being so willing when we came to you with the request to add BigQuery support because uh, you know it's made a big difference for our customers. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you, Retinder, for a fantastic demo. Um, if you have more sessions for us in the future, I'm sure I'm sure the audience will love that. So continuous learning, continuous improvement. Thank you, and till next time.